Hello everyone and welcome to our Object Matrix and Autana Media Group webinar where we'll be looking at the powerful Cubix orchestration platform along with the secure media focused object storage matrix store. Um, I'm here Mark Haberfield, sales engineer at Object Matrix and on the line we also have James Gibson from Autana Media Group. Hi guys and hi Mark, nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs> um, so today we're just going to have a bit of a company overview, a look at what both the companies, where we came from, etc. Uh, a look at the products uh, and what they do and what we do uh, in particular. We'll then have a quick look at the workflow, how we envisage the two projects working together, and then we'll demonstrate exactly those things in action. And at the end, we'll just do a quick Q&A and uh, let you know how to get in touch with us uh, out there. So without further ado, I'll start and I'll start to tell you a little bit about Object Matrix. Um, well, we're a software company from sunny South Wales, and we're a pioneer of object storage. Um, we started back in 2003, but the history goes further back than that, because the founders all started and helped build what's considered to be the first object storage system, uh, which is still used in the world today. We only focus on uh, media, um, so protecting our co protecting content is our business, and working in media is our passion. Um, we only focus on those media workflows, uh, whereas the other storage vendors out there get you to adhere to their workflows or design the workflows for you. We're more about being flexible and designing our technology around your workflow and your challenges. I said we started back in 2003 and being pioneers we had a, a product um, that was object storage and we had an API in 2004. Obviously very early to market um, and not many people knew what those things were back then. Um, so in 2005 we started the first storage as a service, an online cloud uh, archive system in the Netherlands um, that a few people use but again very very early to market with that. Um, in 2006, we started getting our first real customers in the creative workflows, um, and that's when we also decided to start concentrating on the media industry. We spent a bit of time developing applications um, such as the MXFS file system and other things specifically for the media industry. And then in 2009, we also added in our Avid integration um, for people like the BBC and Gorilla, who've been customers of ours for over 10 years now. Um, and from there, we've just grown and grown and grown. Uh, so today, we've got systems in post houses, sports companies, news, more recently, ad agencies, and even recently, some special effects companies as well. So not many other storage companies out there are going to have the same media history as we do, but we've got the expertise in-house to understand media workflows. Um, I think it's safe to say this statement is a bold one out there with a strategic partner who understands your industry, enables global collaboration, increases operational efficiency and empowers connectivity. But what that really means is that we, we want to partner with the end user. We want to make sure the workflow is as efficient as possible and that the people out there aren't just managing media, doing laborious tasks. Um, we want to make sure they've got the ability to search, find, use their assets and generally be creatives and in general uh, being creative makes them money. So we're out there trying to do exactly that and being a partner to our customers. So we need the obligatory customer slide and you'll see customers on there from all over the place, various ones in the UK, France, USA, South Africa, even Latin America. We've got quite a, a large deployment, uh, several deployments down there and as far afield as New Zealand as well. So certainly all around the world. But what you'll probably spot on there as well is a few companies that aren't media companies. Um, they're the banks and the energy companies. Funnily enough, those banks and energy companies actually have media workflows. They've decided to set up edit suites, camera suites, um, or they're just bringing in lots and lots of video data. And they've got exactly the same problem as a media company. They need to ingest, log, tag, archive, and reuse or monetize that data. There are a few on there as well that uh, we can't talk about, but there are larger uh, news and sports organizations out there who are, we are also dealing with uh, quite closely. So with that said, I'll pass you over to James to tell you a little bit about Ortana. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. <clears throat> so Ortana Media Group was started in uh, 2012 in a very similar vein to uh, Object Matrix. Doesn't strictly uh, focus on the uh, idea of media and entertainment when it comes to the challenges of media. Media permit you persist through 
so many different companies now in the modern day and age. Um, so our MAM, which is a, you know, a word we hate to use, uh, media asset management, um, for us, it really focuses more on the uh, orchestration, uh, simply having a, you know, a portal and a database, so many things are there claim to be a MAM nowadays. Um, so our system uh, is a, a MAM under the traditional category, but really focuses on the, the orchestration side and critically is designed not to be uh, pigeonholed into a particular vertical within the uh, media space. Um, so we get the next slide there, Mark. Um, so some key features about Cubix, which is our uh, platform that Ortana develops. Uh, Cubix is designed to be an end-to-end -end platform. It can sit across an entire uh, media supply chain. Uh, now, so media supply chain for us is anything which involves the fulfillment of media. Uh, traditionally, of course, this would be, say, a, a VOD fulfillment packaging or, or playout, um, but it can literally be uh, anything. If, if our target endpoint is uh, Facebook or an LTO tape, uh, it is designed to be malleable enough to be configured to suit uh, the requirements of the workflow. A key, key thing uh, Ortana believes in is that the system should be configurable to suit your needs rather than having to, you know, you adapt to, to meet to the system. One of the key things that we do very well is integration. So today we're integrating, uh, showing our integration today with Object Matrix, um, with the Matrix Store device, but obviously we have <clears throat> over 50 different integrations across storage, cloud, auto QC, archive, LTO, transcoding, uh, just to name but a few, uh, all of which you can find on our website. But the, um, they all integrate out the box uh, with Cubix, and that allows you very quickly to glue together existing multi-vendor estates and be able to then deploy those within workflows very rapidly. So workflows are a key part of what Cubix does. Uh, we're a big believer in the lights out workflow. Uh, our workflows can be entirely manual. There's no uh, mandated requirement to be fully automated, but of course the goal of efficiency is to remove as many manual steps in a workflow as we, as we can and really to provide that goal of continuous improvement, continuous operations. Everything in Cubix is a web-based UI. So Cubix can be deployed, uh, deployed fully on premise be deployed fully in the cloud or is a, a true hybrid. Uh, but no matter how or where it's deployed, you're looking at it through a web browser, uh, which just means that you don't have those issues regarding access issues and you know different platforms and support. Uh, and the key goal really with Cubix obviously is business efficiency. So we achieve that through configurable business rules, uh, again, with that goal of removing uh, either human intervention. So we have a lots of different features for Cubix. And if Marks can bring up our next slide here, it gives you a bit of a taste of uh, the different products that we offer within the Cubix stack. Um, so these are all built out of the same uh, architecture, but these really demonstrate the different distinct use cases that we've deployed to date uh, for Cubix. Um, so starting at the top with the key ones, obviously regarding sort of broadcast or fulfillment, but then moving on to things like workflows for Avid ingest or editorial ingest platform uh, distribution. And Cubix is fully integrated with all the major public services for uh, AI and content learning. So we do some quite advanced content discovery workflows. Um, we also work with um, FlexiCarts. So those of you who are still dealing with tape and film, we have a very strong offering as regards to, to that space. We also have deployments where we're driving a mobile app as our target with native integrations or API there, as well as then more of our pure cloud offerings where we offer uh, transcoding as a service, but also being able to drive your own cloud platforms in the cloud. Um, so as you can see, Cubix is used for many different use cases traditionally within the media space, but as Mark says, more and more now, you know, non-media entities such as banks and large corporates having the exact same challenges that we've been facing here in the media space for some time. So some of the existing customers that we have for Cubix, um, these are more the traditional ones in our space, um, but just to give you an idea of the, uh, the kind of different users we have. So the large broadcasters using it for end-to-end -end large migrations, uh, bulk digitization workflows, film scanning, and even clients who are outside of media. We have some clients here, Virtual One, who have nothing to do with the media space. They simply use it as a pick, pack, and ship orchestration platform for their fulfillment the workflow. Uh, Evolutions being a more recent client using it for uh, the editorial ingest workflows. This is the Avid workflow. And uh, Pierce being a, a music label, he's using it again for fulfillment, but without the no video assets, purely audio process. So a good smattering of examples there to show you the, the different use cases. Um, and on the next slide here, we've got just to kind of bring to life those particular features that those users are using. So in hybrid, in the uh, sorry, summary key thing about Cubix and Ortana is like I say, we are uh, very modular, so to be very scalable. Um, and we have a, a policy of really allowing you to license only the bits that you need. Um, so unlike most asset management and orchestration platforms, which are very large, uh, very lumpy, very uh, long time to deploy, 
uh, Cubics allows you really just to run the bits that you need, critically license just the bits that you need, uh, and allows us to have this really uh, multifaceted product offering, uh, which covers the, the key features that you're after. Uh, so therefore, I think we'll pass on back now to Mark to talk a bit more about Matrix. Great, thanks, James. Um, so yeah, what is a matrix store? Well, it's an object storage platform. Um, it's a true object storage platform with the metadata, data and policies all held together in a true object. Um, and it's built to be optimized for video workflows, uh, integrated into your media workflows. And we achieve that by massive efforts with our fantastic partners, such as Ortana Media Group, where we do all the testing and the integration so you ensure that your users will get the, the great experience. Hopefully you'll see from these slides and demos that Matrix Store is more than just a bit bucket or a file system. Um, it's certainly something that works specifically well for the media industry. And how do we do that? What do we offer? Well, we offer what we call digital content governance. Uh, it's more about protecting the data, but at the same time making sure you've got true access to that data. You can choose the policies around it, the business rules. You can have built-in disaster recovery and business continuity plans. But a lot of it is all around that special object metadata and the full metadata support. So not only do we back up your data, we back up your metadata and make sure you've got full access to it. That's the future-proof element there, making sure that in the future, you're not just going to end up with a doorstop um, full of assets that you can't get back to. You're always going to have access to the data and the metadata. A bonus as well built into the system is something we call process in place, where we, of course, work in the media industry, so we recognize a media asset. We recognize IMFs, AS11s, XMP, and even just the standard EXIF camera metadata, um, as well as image metadata. A recent release in the last year has also been the powerful analytics tool attached to it, a product called Sense. It's basically building up a detailed database of what's happening through the life cycle of your assets so that you, again, can understand uh, how much it's costing you to keep your assets, how they're being used, and who's getting access to everything. Talked about access quite a bit. We've got the standard interfaces, not just an S3, as everyone else seems to have these days, but your access via Samba, NFS, FTP our API, as well as a RESTful API, and then our additional tools, DropSpot and Vision. They add additional uh, workflows into the media industry, but then we've also got an application called MXFS, Matrix Store File System. It's a free and fast application installed on Windows, Mac, and Linux, and it just mounts it as a local drive. That means you can suddenly fulfill many, many workflows, whether that's um, in your servers or at your end users, um, and certainly integrated very, very well. So we scale in capacity and workflows throughout the generations. We've got customers who've just added new hardware, expired off their old stuff without any migration needed. It just does it all for you. So again, the, the, the ability to be fully future-proof uh, and continually working and growing with your business, as well as growing into the new workflows that come along. So I mentioned our applications. We've got quite a few in this bit of a spider diagram, but let me just quickly mention the, some of the key ones. Um, down in the bottom right there, we've got a product called Interconnect. That's our tie-in with Avid Interplay PAM, and that's the one that can mirror your Interplay into a matrix store. Now, we keep all of the details of that, the mob ID, all the links together for the sequences, the effects, et cetera. Um, and again, working with Ortana, they can produce a, a, a um, proxy of that, so it's a visible asset within our system. And then we can also um, take that to a second location on a second matrix store where you can restore it to any other interplay PAM. Well, that suddenly becomes your DR uh, and business continuity plan built in to the system. We've obviously got the matrix store API and the RESTful API. If you wanted to do some direct integration, such as Ortana Media Group have done directly to our API. But then we've got the standard Samba and NFS interfaces. Just mount it as a local drive and away you go. DropSpot is our ingest tool. It's a little bit clunky, but it still works, and it's still very, very fast, which is why it's used still today. Um, it's just a very good way of getting assets onto your matrix store as fast as possible. Vision is our web-based browsing of your entire matrix store. And again, that's becoming more and more media focused. And certainly, we're listening to all of our customers for the uh, features that are coming in and integrating Vision directly in with Ortana, as you'll see shortly. 
I mentioned MXFS, Matrix Store File System, mount it as a local drive, super quick access um, on your servers, on your Windows, Mac or Linux machines. It's certainly filling a lot of workflows. Now, everyone seems to have an S3 gateway these days, and ours is called S3 Connect. We act as if we're an S3 bucket. Uh, we're as close as we can be to the full S3 protocols, um, but again, that allows many, many other integrations and many, many other tools to talk directly to us. And then finally, move to S3. That's where we push to other S3 devices. So whether that's a, an S3 in Amazon or Google or one of the many ones out there, um, but it allows us that extra hybrid, automated, policy-driven workflows uh, into the world there. How do you deploy Matrix Store? Well, nine times out of ten, it's probably going to be an on-premise private cloud. Um, of course, the internet's getting better and better these days, so a lot of people have started pushing into data centers, off-premise private cloud, or have their backup at least. And that way, they, their end users can, again, connect from anywhere and can start using their data in a secure matrix store um, anywhere they like. Uh, more recently, we've started uh, deploying matrix store as a service. In the UK, we've got several customers. In South Africa, we've got many customers. In France, we've got our first one coming very shortly, and we're also pushing into the US. But again, matrix store as a service allows you a bit more control of your data. Um, it's the kind of uh, fixed pricing, um, so you've got no egress costs, but you know that you've got a predictability of cost with all the same security levels, but no worries about sovereignty. You know exactly where that data is. It's in our servers, in our rack, in our data center. And I think the last slide is just to understand that we, we tend to talk about benefits for all the stakeholders these days. It's not just the, the one person in the company who makes a decision about storage anymore. It's, the, it's everyone who really wants to get involved with it. So from the end users, uh, having an integrated, non-disruptive um, system, easy to find, browse and share, intuitive interfaces, et cetera. And then we've got the, the ability to uh, look after the CEO, the CFO, et cetera, through the system. So we, that C level is quite important there. So obviously they want to see a clear return on investment um, and they're focused on generating uh, actual growth for the company. So having a matrix store, we want to be able to help everyone with that. The flexibility, the ability to grow the revenue with reduced expenses, etc. And then finally, the CTO, he's, he's out there, he needs to make sure we've got a future-proof, flexible deployment, fully secure, scalable, um, making sure that there's minimal downtime and that all of his uh, end users are happy with the system. And that's kind of seen with the customers we have, you know, customers all around the globe, large media industry customers, all working with Matrix Store and being our partner. I'll hand back over to James now so he can tell you a lot more about Cubix. Thank you, Mark. And uh, just to put in the chat window there, if you do have any <clears throat> questions, other Mark and I are talking through the two different products, do you, uh, go ahead and post them in the chat line. So, as I mentioned before, we do have a lot of different product-based use cases for Cubix. Um, so what I'd like to do now is just focus a little bit more on the uh, architecture, both from a uh, conceptual basis and also then from a, just a physical deployment, uh, just because the time we have today, and I appreciate so many of you on the call today will have so many different use cases rather than focusing only one particular one, just better to take a slightly more uh, holistic view. So we logically break Cubix down into three layers. Uh, the first layer is our asset management layer. Uh, it's file and format agnostic. So we are able to manage any digital uh, file type. We understand reference files uh, working a lot within the post-production space. So DPX, DCP, uh, AS11, um, but also uh, P2 WhatsApp, and, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, B2 op atom formats and other such camera files. And we can actually add our own dictionaries into Cubix to add new ones as and when they uh, come on board, making it again future proof. Cubix is very strong at managing editorial metadata. Uh, in Cubix, we actually separate media from metadata, allowing you to have uh, an asynchronous workflow. So if you have a large amount of metadata coming in and then the media is going to come in last minute, or vice versa, you have media but no metadata, Cubix can support both of those in parallel. Uh, and Cubix being full, fully multi-tenanted uh, allows you to configure different schemas, workflows, branding, access rights, and everything on a per client basis or a content owner basis uh, within the system. 
Because Cubix also understands things like ancillary files, so whether they be artwork, subtitles, audio stems, we can associate those into a hierarchy, uh, allowing you again to easily create a bank of content uh, with everything associated ready for easy restore, whether that be you know, in an archive or for going out to VOD or player. So our next layer is our automation layer. Now, <clears throat> in the automation layer, we have these ideas called harnesses. So a harness is a very small, very light application, uh, runs as a service, uh, can be deployed on Windows, Linux, or Mac, and very simply consumes the API of the device in question. So for all of our uh, over 50 integrations we have with things like, like say, S3, uh, Zendata, Object Matrix, of course, things like Vantage, and, and so on, just to name but a few, each one of these has its own harness. Now, on one side, it, com it consumes the native API. So in the case of um, Object Matrix, we've com consumed the Jar API, which allows us to give us full control of the device. And on the other side, there is a, a generic API talking to the core Cubic system. Now, these all work over web service, which means that we can deploy these where they need to be deployed, uh, which means they don't have to be in the same place as the core Cubic system. And in many cases, they need to be in the same place as the device they're controlling. So this idea of hybrid is really where this starts to come to play where, sure, we could locate Cubix in S3, but you could keep all of your content within your local network and it never leave the local network because we just have those control services and database running in Amazon. So it really gives you that ability to pick and mix and choose where you run, want to run devices. Key thing about these harnesses though, is that they're done by design. Uh, the harness in question has no uh, workflow intelligence. It simply is given uh, tasks to perform, jobs as we call them, and the harness will execute those and report back on the success or failure of those jobs. The reason for that is we want to abstract the business rules, the decision-making parts of Cubix into a separate layer, our orchestration layer. So we have something called TaskFlow. This is our main uh, BPM engine. Uh, it's very similar to others on the marketplace. We have some very key differences though, but this idea of being able to configure a, a high-level workflow which allows you to drive the system. Um, our approach, as you'll see when we demo it later, is to kind of have a linear with branches as opposed to trying to render the whole thing on a singular two-dimensional screen. And uh, those of you who've used other workflow engines out there in the marketplace, no doubt would have struggled with the complexity even quite simple workflows can have when you try and render everything on a two-dimensional display. I'm very pleased to say our workflow engine doesn't suffer that. Um, and then we also have our Meteor's engine, which are really short process chains, if this do that. So if a file comes in, make a proxy, send off to object matrix, uh, perform an audio index, so on and so forth. So these can just be house rules that are configured that don't have to have implicit workflows designed. The key thing is that our orchestration though, all that decision-making is entirely separate from our automation layer, the thing that actually does the work. And that's because, again, given that so many of you today will have different use cases, the ability to configure easily and quickly and critically reconfigure a workflow is essential in any orchestration system and the moment that you find that the layer doing the work, i.e. the automation layer, is also involved in the business rules, that's where issues regarding development, new releases, and you know, extra professional services creep in. And so by having that true abstraction, uh, we don't suffer that problem. So we have a fully uh, documented RESTful API available on our website, um, which allows you to access all three layers. And of course, we have a number of different portals um, that allow you to access the stack depending on the use case in question. A little analogy that we have to kind of bring to life this concept of abstraction we have, Mark can bring up the next slide for me there, um, is this idea of the kitchen. So if you're in the kitchen and you're cooking, you have, of course, your ingredients, you know, what they are, where they are, how many sub and so forth, if you will, the, the assets and metadata. We have our equipment, you know, mixers, blenders, microwaves, and so forth. And of course, they have their API, their interface, you know, buttons on the front to drive. And of course, we have the recipe. And it goes without saying that we can change the recipe without rebuilding the kitchen. I mean, that's common sense. Uh, so many systems on the marketplace, you know, the recipe is within the device. And so when you change the recipe, that's where you know, professional services and hassle creep in. Our, our recipe is completely abstracted. You can design, redesign, backup, restore, change very, very rapidly and not have that issue that you know, so many other systems face. So looking at our physical architecture, we go to the next slide there. Um, we are a, a .NET stack for the main part, um, but also we are fully deployed now on Linux as well as Mac, so we are no longer tied to the Windows OS. Um, you can deploy around uh, a SQL Server on-premise, or you can also deploy around Amazon RDS or SQL Zero if you wish to use cloud. Um, and then we set up core services which run 
Um, and then we have our harness architecture, which will say you can run where they need to run as well. So it's a very simple, it's a very light deployment. Uh, we have cubic systems which are running on a, a single VM for you know test or small deployments, all the way through to uh, <clears throat> cubic deployments where we're running over 30 or 40 machines, uh, where we've you know, three or four of those would be for core services and the remainder of them being for transcoding. Um, so the system will genuinely scale and contract. It is a genuine enterprise platform, but by no means has a minimum footprint uh, that we understand a lot of the other sort of leading man providers have in the marketplace. Uh, this thing, again, will scale and contract as needed. And even in some use cases, we actually control within the MAM that scale and contraction. We have integration with the S3 API, so we can actually stand up and turn down uh, VMs in the cloud as needed, you know, which is quite useful when you're doing a transcoding workflow. Now, the different portals that we have in Cubix, um, we're going to focus today purely on the technical portal. Uh, this being the, as the name says, the, the main kind of control of Cubix and shows you all the detail. Um, but it's not always the best portal you know, for every stakeholder. Uh, as, as Mark says, we're very used to the fact that we have C-level people working in, obviously the engineering and operations team, but we may have external freelancers or a journalist or end user customers you're trying to interact with the stack. And so we try and make sure that we have a, a portal best suited uh, to use. Now, all of our portals are fully multi-tenanted. Um, they're fully white labeled, so you can brand them as needed. Um, our distribution portal uh, is one which is very much, as the name says, decided for, for distributions, end users, being able to browse through in kind of a, a Netflix style experience to search for you and find content, and then look at that to then do fulfillment. Uh, that fulfillment can be simply, you know, select and restore, or it can drive a, a commercial process, whether that be account-based or, or credit card-based to actually uh, do that procurement. The kiosk portal is a, a simpler portal. It's kind of designed really around rushes, so being able to easily search for you and find content. Uh, all three of those portals, technical distribution and kiosk, all make use of our contact indexing engine. So we can do uh, automatic speech to text, object detection, and be able to do semantic searching around all that metadata that we acquire. And then we have three kind of more simpler portals, review and approve, where literally I can send you a link where you can then approve and reject, uh, but nice little things like we track how, you know, how far through somebody's viewed the asset. Interestingly, we find that you know things are being uh, approved without the whole asset being viewed. Um, the Rushes portal, which gives you very much, uh, uh, for those who hold onto the Mac, um, that kind of Mac experience of being able to browse folders and, and see what Rushes are available. Uh, and then finally, our kind of Weave transfer style portal, which is where you can very easily uh, upload and download content in and out of the system um, without having any credentials to the system so you know it's a secured and limited scope that's been decided by the person who sent you the link so again we try and tailor uh, and suit the stack to, to show that so in summary really about cubics and the key benefits um i can't stress enough that it's designed to be uh, very configurable to suit your needs Can we get the next slide there mark um, and the key thing is that you know workflows change we fully understand having been doing your workflow deployment style for over six years seven years, excuse me, um, that the, uh, you know, you know, the, the project requirements will change. So many times when you start a project, uh, you know, by the time the hardware's been procured and systems been put in, you know, the, the business requirements have changed. And we're very used to that. We're very uh, flexible in that regard. Your queues can be fully lights out. Obviously, where that's possible, we will always do that. Um, but of course, can also be, uh, you know, day one can be fully manual workflows where we start manual and then step by step swap our elements for, for automation to allow that kind of big bang fear to be avoided. Um, our workflow engine, again, as we talk through, being fully abstracted allows you to easily and very quickly de deploy and redeploy workflows. Um, we are a hybrid architecture and we genuinely mean that. You can run this where you need to run this. And we have many clients running out of AWS, many clients running on-prem, and again, I say a good hybrid of multi-site or two sites in the cloud or that kind of thing. It does scale, as we said. It will scale up and down. You know, really talks about scaling up. Well, we understand that, you know, the need to be able to run very light is also very important. Uh, out the box, like I say, we've got, I think it's 52 integrations now. Uh, Object Matrix obviously being one of those that we're demonstrating today. So what that means is normally when we come and look at your estate, uh, whether it be a greenfield or existing site, quite quickly, we can really glue together those existing devices into a common architecture. Um, one of the biggest things moving into orchestrated workflows is just simply moving human errors. Orchestration is very good at doing the same thing, you know, obviously again and again, and that really helps uh, you know, remove error levels down in the system, but also um, being able to react to business. 
uh, continuity. So when you have problems in the business, when you're having issues with the workflow, Cubix is very good at proactively alerting you because you know, SLAs are being breached or deadlines aren't being met. Uh, and we can show you those through our real-time dashboards and things like alerts we have with Slack integration and so forth. So the goal of Cubix really is to have it tell you where things are going wrong rather than you to having to monitor the 100%. You, know, you can just monitor the, the one or 2% which is going wrong. Finally, a key thing to understand about Cubix is that you don't need to buy the whole system. Uh, so many MAMs out there, the licensing is, you know, you buy it and it's very heavy, it's very expensive, and that can actually be, you know, commercially prohibitive to some of the projects you have. We only uh, offer Cubix on a global basis, but also we offer on an appliance basis. Um, so our different appliance use cases would be, say, a transcoder, uh, our editorial ingest solution, bulk ingest solution, and this allows you to just license the subsections of Cubix that you require. Uh, we have some things like a data mover, for example. So you get the benefit of the full Cubix stack, but a far more uh, cost-effective approach. We also offer both CapEx and subscription licensing um, with three to 12 month notice periods on those as well. So again, we try and make the commercial terms as flexible as we can as the, the technical terms as well. So enough of Mark talking about all this. Let's actually show some of it, shall we, Mark? Yeah, sure. So we're just going to look at our, our uh, workflows quickly. Um, we've obviously got the clear tiering between different levels of storage and Ultana, like you said, can be the glue uh, to make that happen while maintaining the, the matrix store uh, for your nearline and archive workflows. Um, we're also doing quite a lot with LTO migration at the moment. And again, um, Ultana allows you to really get that metadata off of those old LTO tapes and get that into the matrix store where it's searchable, usable, um, proxies allow you to view it, and then you can decide what to do with it afterwards, where you're going to send it or how you're going to try and monetize that afterwards. You know, just to say, Mark, a key one on that is the we do support the Diva API. Um, so those of you who've got your clients or yourselves who have a Diva instance and they're looking to migrate off that to object matrix, we have a you know, out the box, plug and play, ready to go solution persisting not only all the diva metadata from the diva level but also if you have diva director we're able to persist all the metadata from that as well thank you and then just the last one the idea of a single pane of glass um, for your content management um, you'll see just any second now i will switch over to our demonstration so one of the key products within Matrix Store is our vision interface. This is a look onto your assets. It's a live view of your assets. It's completely customizable, so you can skin it with your logos, your color scheme, etc. And it's a great look into your Matrix Store. You can look in and had you uh, set up some videos, etc. You can dive into those videos and you can decide to start playing things. Um, I'm going to find one that I actually want to play today, which is this one here. Um, and again, we can now start to see the video. So you can see we've got the ability to change time. We've got some extra time formats, etc., cetera, um, as well as the usual JKL stuff. But more importantly, we've got the ability to turn on clipping. This clipping is quite nice in that we can suddenly just drag it in, find the, the short clip or the part of the uh, video that we actually want to see and hit the clip button. I give it a quick rename. Uh, because I want to be able to find it afterwards. Um, and I create it. And that's going to go off now, tell Ortana that the subclip needs to be made. And in the background, Ortana is doing exactly that. I could dive into my Ortana dashboard. Um, James will go into this in a lot more detail shortly. But I just want to quickly check my object matrix partial restores. Here's some I've done earlier. Here's the one in progress. And there it is chugging away. Of course, not many people are going to come in here and have a look at this. They just want to see their assets uh, growing over time. Since I've got a couple of seconds, I'll quickly talk you through um, the uh, Matrix Store admin tool. Um, we've got built-in audits. We've got the ability to check on the nodes, what's happening. All those tasks running in the background, making sure your assets are safe, bit for bit perfect, verified constantly. Uh, full aid, uh, Active Directory and LDAP integration, as well as a really granular look at how the actual users can be uh, broken up and what they've got permission to see, use, or do uh, within those vaults. 
I say the word vaults. To, to us, a vault is a workspace, or uh, for one of a better word, a bucket. And this is where you start giving it policies. Uh, so today, I'm going to set up a vault. I can give it a name, capacities. I can decide what audits I'm doing. I can set the integrity levels for MD5, Adler 32, etc. And I can set some compliance. I'm going to lock down this data for a certain amount of time. Um, and I've got built-in trash cans as well. All of our applications are interchangeable. So if uh, you decide to delete something, it's going to go into a trash can first. And then lastly, that process in place um, where we've got the ability to extract that metadata. I can quickly switch all that on. Um, as well as also replicate, replicate to another matrix store, whether that's in a data center or our matrix store as a service um, out there in the world. I mentioned the built-in analytics as well. This is our analytics database, which we query with just an off-the-shelf um, tool. Um, but it lets us really get into what's happening in our matrix store. Um, out there in the world. And we can look at particular applications hitting the system in a certain way. We can look at particular vaults um, historically and current and see how those are building up over time um, throughout the system uh, out there. And again, it's that ability to really understand what's happening within your matrix store. Well, hopefully by now my asset has made itself. So if I just pop into here and pop into here, of course, it's still running because it would be a live demo. Oh, still going. Great. Well, luckily, I did a couple earlier as well. So you can see these are sub clips of uh, previous ones I was playing with earlier. And we've got that metadata coming off on the side there as well uh, for the shortened clips. What I can do is hand over to you now, James, if you'd like to take control of the screen. And uh, you can show us the here inside of things. Excellent. So um, just checking you see my screen okay there, Mark? Yes, I can see it nicely. Thank you. Great. So what we're going to say, show here is um, the integration that we've uh, done with Vision and just kind of showing you traditional case of a, a stub workflow. Um, so this is where we have a remote piece of storage here. I'm going to use a, an S3 bucket. By no means does it have to be limited to S3 though. Um, it, this could be uh, simply uh, an LTO device or you know, file types that are too heavy to synchronize into your uh, matrix store for everything, but you want to have a representation of vision uh, to allow you to be able to uh, search, find, and view. Uh, so what I'm doing here is just uploading uh, a video asset into my S3 bucket. Uh, now, Cubix works with uh, S3, Backblaze, Wasabi, uh, Google Nail and Coldline, as well as the uh, S3 Glacier, uh, as well as Azure. Uh, pub storage as well. And in all of those cases, we can use uh, the bucket as a watch folder to, to easily trigger and check content into Cubix. Uh, similar to, of course, we can use for remote FTP sites, uh, other pieces of storage as well, and even Vision itself. So you, know, you could have a uh, Vision uh, vault acting as this source uh, for this. So here I've got a, a Cubix system, which is monitoring the storage. I'm just gonna log it here and show from the start. So when I log into Cubix, uh, we're wrapped around Active Directory. Um, we can enable 2FA authentication. Um, so if you have that security requirement, that's easily done. And when I log into Cubix, two things come into play. Uh, once my credential has been validated, uh, my user rights as regards to what functional level I have within the uh, system comes to play, but also what content I have rights to. So for example, I could be a full admin user across the whole system, but only have access to a very limited amount of uh, content in the system. Conversely, of course, I could be you know, read-only, but to everything and, and somewhere in between. So if we go have a quick look in my search here, which is the MP4 files we brought in. And what I should find here is that asset has been uh, registered. So look by the most recently. Here we can see that 1917 asset have come in. If I go look in here, I can see I've got the, the details. Now, this kernel process can be done in the cloud because again, because the harness is doing this can be run where necessary. This can be done within the same zone, same domain as the S3 bucket. And so of course there's no egress fees or, or any charges there. Um, now I noticed at this point I have a thumbnail. Usefully it's chosen a black frame for us, that's useful. Um, but I will get a proxy in due course once the asset has been processed. Now in the same way Mark was showing you the partial restore being driven by task flow, exactly the same here. I have a task flow running in Cubix. If I go ahead and choose here, and I can see my asset passing through, the state of my workflow, and I can select here, I can see what's happening and processing in the system. 
And these different jobs here represent the jobs that are happening at that automation there with those harnesses uh, to do the work. So very quickly whilst it's running to show you the, the TASO engine. Um, so if I go into my existing workflow that I have configured here, um, the first thing I configure is my trigger. So my trigger could be uh, like a basket. So all the portals have the uh, shopping basket icon and allows users to select content and then trigger one or more workflows. Um, a common use case there is to be triggering by file import, in this case working off S3. Uh, but again, I could trigger off a matrix store vault, a local you know, Samba or NFS mount, remote FTP, or in this case, object storage. Um, we can also trigger those through methods such as MRSS, so monitoring MRSS feeds for content ingest. Uh, we could do schedule tasks, so you know, like you would have in Windows, your test runs at time. Uh, things like triggering off a flexi cart, so placing a tape in a flexi and driving us, and, and many more. Now, once you've uh, set your trigger, you then define your journey. So the journey here you'll notice is a linear path. So this is the, uh, the white lines here. We talk about this being the happy path. Um, so here you can see I'm going to do my stub generation elements. So I'm creating the elements needed for matrix store to generate the stub. Um, and then you'll notice that every success step, I can have a fail step. So if I want to bring in here a, a failed sign, so I'm just going to go in here and bring in a, a failed. And I save that. What you'll see is then I get a, a branch. And on that branch, I can go off and start building that. And that in itself can then have their own branches and so on and so forth. So the idea being is that you build this kind of linear with branches, which is a lot easier to uh, first design because if you sit down with a customer and try and work out what the workflow is, quite often we want to talk about you know what should happen before we deal with the what ifs. Um, but also it does away with that challenge that other workflow designers have where they're trying to render the whole workflow on a singular screen. And once I built my journey, I then have my uh, business processes I drag in here. So here we have our matrix store stub generator, which is actually taking the asset that's been triggered and it's going to go and actually generate the stub elements. Uh, and then I can configure how I want to view. Uh, also SLAs in the system, a key thing about Cubics, you can uh, configure SLAs in the workflow, which in itself can trigger other workflows. So maybe to increase capacity or simply to trigger alerts to operational in the business. Uh, and obviously then I have a summary of the workflow as well. Now, hopefully we'll have a little bit more success than our first demo. And there we go. So I can see here that the task came in at 1639, at 16, and at 1641 here, I can see that my stub elements were generated. You see my jobs are successfully completed, including my stub job. So now if I go off to my vision, and just go and do a refresh here, we should see that we gain a new asset, which include ID. So you can see here it's showing it's offline because we've correctly flagged it within the uh, vision system as being an offline asset. Um, but of course, because it's a stub, you see that we have the full proxy ability to uh, easily jump across the timeline with a preview uh, and there. And of course, then this is a full asset, which then could be used for uh, segmenting, as, as Mark demonstrated, uh, or can be you know, requested to be restored as further as needed. And we keep it in sync. So for example, if then somebody wished to take this and promote it for being a, a stub to a full asset, that would easily be done uh, as well. So there's just a very quick and easy demonstration of how the two systems are integrated and how we're able to uh, synchronize external storage, which could be Zen data, you know, Diva or other such RTO devices, maybe cloud storage, or, or simply uh, other storage where you would like to have a representation of vision, but you simply don't have to replicate the whole asset, whether that be for, for space or bandwidth reasons. Hand back over to Mark now, I think. Yeah, great. Thanks for that, James. Super interesting. Um, yeah, I'll take the screen back uh, because I think we're pretty much into the Q&A side of things now. Um, so just to get things growing, going, should I say, um, I'll put a few questions. How long have Object Matrix and Ortana worked together? Well, I think I met James about two years ago, um, and we were talking about various workflows, etc., for quite a while. Uh, but certainly more recently, we've had a, a fairly major project that's uh, really come up and made sure that we're uh, fully integrated now. Um, I can, that, that kind of asks you the second question, where do we deploy? Uh, we have deployments in uh, one solution in the UK at the moment, but that's actually a, a multi-city uh, uh, hosted system. Uh, so it's, it's certainly quite large. And we've got several more going out in the next couple of uh, months as well. So certainly really exciting to be getting that going there. Um, last question I get asked quite often, how, what about that metadata? Well, yeah, of course, Otana is passing us that metadata. Um, anything it finds, it could pass to Matrix Store uh, and vice versa. It's using our API so it can read our metadata. As yeah, just say we, we, we do learn about assets, again, being a system which is very media focused, just like Matrix Store, we do learn very intimately about an asset. So codex, raster, frame rates, bit rates, MD5 hashes, and so forth. 
So all of that mess data, as well as editorial mess data critically, we can pass down to the matrix store and keep in sync. Okay, so let me put out to the uh, people on the webinar now. Is there any other questions you'd like to ask us uh, at this time? Okay, so I've also got um, yeah, no, I've also got uh, John Morgan, our CEO, in the uh, room here with me, and he's just going to mention a few things about our roadmap as well, since we've got a few minutes. Yeah, with Ortana. So um, obviously, we're excited to have the workflow, the or orchestration, the proxy generation, the um, scanning other storage, so that we can see it inside of Vision. All of this stuff is um, super strong and and gives a real new dimension to. Uh, vision as a product um, in combination with uh, the Ortana product. Um, as we go forward, one of the uh, features we're going to add is uh, basically the ability to copy data from Matrix Store to other storage devices without having to go through the, uh, the client browser. So basically, you could be at home, you could log on to Vision, you could say, move this project from Matrix Store to my Nexus. And using the products in combination, that will basically um, start a job off to move the assets from one location to another. So it's really strengthening out um, all the areas you've just seen already, but also there'll be that ability there as well. Okay, I think there's a question. I'm just going to uh, enable attendee unmute because I believe. Brent has a question for us. Brent, you should be able to unmute now. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, we can, can hear you, Brent. That's, that's a really good way to not get a bunch of pesky questions is just mute everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice, nice technique, fellas. <laughs> so uh, I, I want to just ask you a question about scale. Obviously, this is something I've been aware that you guys are working on, and it's been something we've been kind of asking for, I guess, from you, John, since since we started our relationship with Synesis, but, and that was the ability to basically use, uh, use Vision as a very simple portal into not only your object matrix storage, but also your, uh, all the other storage that connects around it. And it looks like now we have a tool to do that. So I guess my first question would be uh, more of a technical question. If, if we connect, if we put this into a client we put the object storage in, but then they've got their third-party production storages. What is, what are the controls that you guys have? Obviously, you have to scan and build your index on the Ortana side of that third-party storage. Am I correct in that? Yeah. So as I mentioned, the, <clears throat> we'd have harnesses to connect to the different bits of storage. If let's take, we say we've got um, well, maybe not an extreme, but you know, we've got three pieces of cloud storage. You know, S3 is or something else. We've got a some Nexus, we've got a Zendate to LTO, maybe some you know, nearline flying around the space as well. So we'd have uh, connectors, you know, a harness connecting into all of these as needed. Um, and well, we I, would... I understand. And, and but mo what I'm mainly getting at is, is have you had a chance to, uh, where, where we've tested a lot of these various systems that uh, do a similar thing, whether you call it a harness or sure. a scanner, a connector, uh, where they where they fall down is when you start to really scale these when you when you connect it to like a large quantum file system that is you know is seven or eight petabytes with yeah. you know the file count over a billion uh, what what are you doing on the scanning are you are you piping all that information into an SQL database are you simply taking the high level and putting it into a JSON how how is this going to scale that that's where my biggest concern comes from when we start to introduce tools like this, because that's where I've had them fall down historically. If that, sure. Does that make sense? Makes absolutely sense. So, I mean, we've, we've tested over six petabytes uh, with some migration we did actually for Diva onto a quantum file system, and then monitoring that afterwards as well. Uh, actively in Soho, we're monitoring sort of two, three petabyte filing systems for renders coming off things like uh, Flame. So a very, very reactive environment that as well. Um, Cubes sure. has two modes for scaling. So at the heart of it, we do have a standard uh, SQL database. More recently, though, we've introduced uh, the use of Elasticsearch. So we have an Elasticsearch database, which also runs as well, which won't be getting up to the yeah. Yeah, 8, 10 million 
uh, asset count that we use on that for some of that as well. The indexing there is reactive. We don't have to you know, index the whole folder to then look for changes. Uh, if we're only okay. needing to monitor a subset of that uh, or from a set piece of time, we can also monitor just from there forwards as well. Um, in the case of object storage as well, because we're working off the event queue, uh, again, you may have a, a rather large uh, storage where you need to filter based on elements that we're interested in. So kind of in part depends on the object in question. So if we're monitoring Diva, for example, you know, let's say you had 5 million objects in Diva, we would learn about those under 10 minutes. But that would be any very high level metadata would then we then begin to restore assets as needed for the, for the lower details. So it is slightly subjected to the storage in question. But to answer your question, yeah. though, we have tested this at scale. Cubix has been used in some very large deployments, very high asset count environments. Mm -hmm. um, and because our matrix or integration sits behind all that Cubix capability, there's absolutely no concerns that we have as regards to that then causing an issue with the matrix store. And again, we can scale by n those number of connections to matrix stores. So if I had 10 matrix stores, you know, I could have 20 different harnesses running, you know, yeah. asynchronously across all of those driving their data through. So the, the yeah. whole thing is generally not only designed to scale, but also not have a single point of failure. The uh, other question, and I, I'm going to make an assumption, so I need you to verify that. I'm assuming that your first scan across a new uh, file system or data storage, whether it's a uh, block level or, or an object storage, your first scan is probably uh, the longest, and then you have very short subsequent scans where you're only scanning for delta? That's correct. And apart from the fact that the short scans, we try and do reactive on proactive. So we're actually looking at getting alerts from the filing system. So where the okay. system supports it. So if we're doing object storage, we'll listen to an event queue. If we're monitoring like a block of NFS or Samba, we'll be doing events off the filing system for when assets are changing. Uh, we also do have a scan that we often you know, recommend doing like once every 24 hours, just in case we've missed an event. Um, right. But yeah, we, our, our scans are designed to be real time. So if we're monitoring a, a piece of netline storage, any change is detected you know, in real time rather than a, a poll every X minutes yeah. or something. And, and if it's production storage, do you have uh throttling ability on your uh, on your harness basically to dial in uh, the, uh, to be able to to have some some performance or parameter controls uh, exactly especially that. if it's storage that's being used during production yeah so normally when we generate uh, in Kubix we configure a location so a location for us could be a vault piece of s3 a diva archive or in your case a, a production storage single volume and on that we then set some parameters so if we're managing that, we can set like a headroom, so the maximum allowed it to fill before we instigate some form of uh, purging according to business rules. We also limit the number of simultaneous connections that we're allowed to make to that device. And then if the device uh, you know, is, is required, so we're also able to limit uh, the maximum bandwidth that we have. Uh, and we can do things like a bit of a half-life rule. So for example, the first transfer will get 75% of the available bandwidth, and then the next one will get 75% of the 15, and the next one, can, you know, so we can constantly react to the current transfers going off as well. Um, okay. Commonly inside networks, we can use semi-transfers, but often we you try and use things like FTP internally to the network because FTP as a protocol is one of the uh, least overhead you know, expensive uh, protocols. Um, so we can control FTP, we control Samba transfers, and again, <coughs> you know, any form of uh, object storage transfer, we can control it there as well. Um, so okay. yeah, we, we fully understand the need not to uh, overwhelm you know, a piece of storage. We want to be there in the background monitoring and tracking and, and by no means impairing the AE. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks for that, guys. Um, I don't think there's any more questions out there, so I'm going to be aware of time. We've gone on for 10 minutes over what I would normally go, but thank you very much for everyone who watched. Um, it'll be available in uh, online in the not too distant future. Um, and thank you very much. Please do get in contact if you have any questions. The joint solution sheet is on our website uh, if you need it. And thank you very much for everyone for joining. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, John. Appreciate Thanks, James. it. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Thank you, guys.